Welcome to the show, folks. I'm Brent Holland. Welcome, one and all, to the Brent Holland Show. Tonight, folks, we've got an incredible guest for you. Christine Weber is here. Christine Weber, just the just let me read a little bit, just a tiny bit, of her incredible career. Uh, she's won an Emmy, by the way, folks. Let me just start off by saying that. And how many people do you know that have won Emmys? And she's achieved all that. Uh, she's executive producer for the National Geographic TV channel. Developed, wrote, and pitched shows concepts. Oversaw editorial budget and schedules on multiple simultaneous projects occurring globally. And you know what, folks? If I continue with this incredible resume that I have here in front of me, we will definitely run out of time. Christine, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for coming on and speaking with the students today. Thanks, Brett. Nice to, nice to talk to you. I've been in the past year working for places like Save the Children, another group called Meridian International Center. Um, I really decided I'd had such a great experience in broadcast television and it enabled me to travel around the world and meet fascinating people and tell great stories that it was time to, to give back. And um, as you may know, television has changed quite a bit and there's a little bit less of the kinds of things that I love to do, which is uh, tell science and natural history and history stories. And there's a little bit less of that reality television has changed things just a bit. Chris, what were the things when you were in your university that you were trying to aspire to? Now, you didn't start off saying, I want to become an Emmy Award winner. What did you start off in? Yeah, I, my career was a lot of luck. I was a biology major. I was headed for med school. I had actually changed plans already by the end of undergrad and decided to go into graduate school in public health. Um, I had a, a long association with Native Americans at University of Michigan and was very involved in their group, so I wanted to work on an Indian reservation. So I had moved out to California where I was going to go to grad school in public health, but was had to establish residency out there to, to go as an in-state student so I could afford it. And I uh, was working for Manpower, which your young audience won't know, but it was an, an old temp organization where you filled in for people on vacation. And I got a call one day from National Geographic they needed a receptionist for a week, and it was um, the fork in the road. I ended up staying with them for many years and working my way up and uh, abandoned the idea of, of, of being a doctor or a public health worker and um, reveled in the joys of traveling the world being a, a television producer instead. Now, what were the things that enticed you to take that direction? I think I'm inherently in, an inquisitive person, and... When you make a film, you are being paid to learn everything you can about a subject. And whether it was whooping cranes or elephants or the Bismarck or the Maya, um, I had to find, you know, read everything I could about it, see every film that had already been done, call the experts, the top leading scientists in that field, and then go to the place, meet them, work with them, talk to them. Um, it was almost too good to be true. When you started out, what were some of the barriers you faced right out of the gate? You know, there, there weren't many, to be honest. I mean, the barriers were that I had no television schooling. I had no production schooling. So I remember one boss um, get, getting frustrated with me because there's a language to filmmaking. You know, you, there's positions. You need to know the difference between a a producer and a director and a cameraman and an editor and a production manager and in those days we shot everything on film so you need it's 16 millimeter and you need and those days again there was there was it was so different then but what an inner positive was and an inner negative and a, um, there was just a, a whole language to it so but you know because I was starting at the bottom and didn't mind starting at the bottom I mean um, that I that I was able to learn on the job and I think the biggest lesson that I learned and then I told other people that were trying to get into the business is that I think the reason that I was so successful is I was a great receptionist. And what I used to tell people is, you know, it's do the best job of whatever job you're asked to do. So if it's in those days typing scripts or getting somebody coffee or um, whatever it was, Xeroxing something, it was, or taking a phone message, you know, I did that with as much conscientiousness as, as I would any other job and and in 
television in production, everything is expensive. Every minute is expensive. Every day in the field is expensive. And nobody's going to trust you to do that if you can't take a good phone message. As you were working your way up that ladder, how did you deal with the stress of always having to prove yourself again and again and again? Um, in the later part of my career, when you know your your success depended on ratings, and there's so little uh, as an executive that you have you, that you can control in ratings. You know, a lot of it is the night that the show airs on, or how much promotion it got, and so I think that's tougher when you get to that position. In the early days where where I did have a lot of control where I could I was in the field and I was making decisions and um, and I hired the crew and I decided in the editing room what to cut um, that that was easier than being in a position where you're still held responsible but you have um, you have very little control or a bit, you know you can't always control all the all the factors that that determine success the best advice I was ever given by by a mentor of mine who was was a producer that I worked with for years is that you needed to make a film three times that you made a film on paper that's the film you you, the, you pitched that you wrote a treatment on that um, that the idea that was in your head okay. and then when you got out in the field and you were actually with the people and dealing with whatever was really happening at the moment, you had to keep an open mind. You couldn't just say, I'm only going to do what I put on paper. You had to say, oh, you know, this character that I didn't even know was great is actually fabulous and he's exciting and doing some interesting work or whatever it was. And then you had to be open again and make it the third time. And that's in the edit room because then you had to see what did I really come back with? And in those days, you didn't know what you had because they had to process the film. That's so it right. wasn't just looking at the, the video, you know, in the field and saying, oh, that didn't work. It was coming back and saying, oh boy, you know, we spent two days getting that shot, but it's not very interesting or that scene or that guy's not engaging or, you know, or, and that's just not what I hoped. And you have to say, all right, that doesn't end up in the cut, you know, and, and but this scene that that we did at the spur of the moment then we didn't plan is great. And that's actually where the story is. So you had to, you know, think it through three times and be open and not try and be rigid to what your first idea was. And was there think, anything or, like that occurred in your Emmy Award winning Bismarck? When you're when you're looking for a shipwreck, you spend hours and hours and hours looking at a, a blank screen of water and fish going by. And and so most of the time you don't even roll the camera because nothing's happening. But I realized that was so much a part of the process that I filmed what I called the boring sequence, you know, which was Bob Ballard, who discovered the Bismarck, um, you know, sitting there looking at a screen, and you see, you know, people's eyes drooping, and you and you see the the boredom in the room. And I thought, you know, this is not, not probably a sequence we'll use, but we were bored too, so we wanted something to film, so we shot it. And it ended up really being a key part of the film because. You know, we always we make it look too easy, and a lot of the things that we film and do shows on, and we we don't show the patience you need to have and the time it takes, yeah. and it, it gave the film some peaks and valleys. It gave this moment when you saw, you know, just how long, long you had to wait, and then when when we suddenly filmed the crew, you know, the whole shipboard crew scrambling because they they realized they had seen this um, light on the bottom of the ocean and this boot then. Um, that they had found it, that made it even more dramatic because you had the sequence before it that was, you know, you'd think would be boring, but built up the tension to the to the dramatic scene. Yeah. It's like music, you know, it goes along and then all of a sudden the crescendo comes and it's a release. That's exactly it, yeah. You know, tension, release, tension, release. Now, yeah. how do you achieve that when you're doing a documentary? Um, you know, this is the gift, I suspect, that you, that you retain because... If it's too long between crescendos, people are just going to, how do you do that? Is it a sense of your own aesthetics? Yeah, and you know, it's it's very different whether you're doing a show for PBS where there's no commercial breaks or whether you're doing something for a commercial network where there are breaks. So when you have something with commercials in it, and, and usually that's a five-act structure, then you need to have a cliffhanger at the end of every act because your whole job is to hold people through the commercial. And on cable television, that can be three minutes of commercials. So you got a long time to, to somebody's, they're probably surfing, they, 
that's enough time to go to the bathroom, get a beer, and check five other channels. So <laughs> you need to have something, some question unanswered, and something that they're waiting to find out that they're going to come back in the next act. Now, on a PBS show where you've got no commercial breaks, you need those kind of built-in peaks and valleys, and that, but that overall arc that goes through the whole story so that they so they stay through to the very end and so that's the secret is what is that what is that unanswered question why uh, why should they keep watching um when they can have a great fabricated drama on 10 other channels what what's bringing them back and keeping them in their seats to find out so you you want to have something that has you know and it can be as simple as and in the Bismarck story, we, we interwove the historical story with the search. And so you've got, will they find it? But that's interwoven with, will they capture it historically? And in this case, because there were all these, the, when the ship sunk, there were all these survivors in the water. Um, it's a very emotional tale because we interviewed survivors from the Bismarck. Um, you know, will, who will live and die? Because the, the, the rescue ship, the Dorchester, thought they saw a U-boat, and so they left, and guys that were almost about to be rescued were left in the water to die. So, you know, so you had these unanswered questions that, that the audience is waiting to find out. Yeah, I was going to ask you how you interweave the human elements along with an inanimate object such as the Bismarck, and I think you just answered that uh, very succinctly and very accurately. And that's the real story, isn't it, is that human in input to all these it stories? It really is. I mean, and it's something, it's, a, it's an interesting evolution in television that, that character has become critical and, it's, and it can be both human and animals and that the best wildlife films follow individual animals. Um, that, so you invest it in that animal, that animal is a character. And, and, but you can also make something like a ship can be a character too. But, and this is why reality television is so successful because now we've moved to real characters. But we inherently relate to people and their struggles and, and their emotions. And, and so you need, you need those strong characters. And in de deciding what shows to produce, that is the key criteria. You know, who are the characters and are they engaging? Can we relate to them? And um, and what do I like that person or not like that person? But you need to have an emotional reaction to that person. <laughs> Christine Weber's our guest today. She's a multiple Emmy Award winner. How great is that? And she's given some time for us tonight. Um, just having a wonderful time talking about everything documentary. Have you ever worked with Jane Goodall, by the way? Jane was on the show. I have. I'm a huge fan. In Me fact, too. I was talking to somebody else about her today. She is a remarkable woman. And both in in the big picture and what she's done, not only for chimps um, and and primates in general, but for for other species for preserving wild habitats, she's also just a remarkable human being. And and it's something that I think is fascinating and, and of, about her is that when you're in a meeting with her, say you're in a group meeting, almost everyone will come out of that meeting thinking she spoke directly to them. And she has this way of making eye contact and looking you right in the eye, but doing that with everybody in a meeting at one point or another. So you feel this connection to her. And through that powerful ways of communicating, and maybe it's from her study with, with chimps and the work she's done, um, she, she really has been able to affect great, great change. And the woman is unbelievable. I think she turns 85 this year. That's amazing. Um, I, I just saw her last, last year at a film festival in Jack, Jackson Hole, and she still is on the road, I think 90% of the time. She, she ne rarely gets home. She's constantly out there fighting the good fight, and um, she, she, what, what she's done for, for globally for, for animals in the wild, and particularly primates, is, um, is really amazing and, and so commendable. Let's tell some stories, Chris. What's your most favorite story you like to tell when you're sitting around chatting with folks? Oh, Something surprising. Boy, that's a hard one. It would probably be one of my favorite films to work on was a film I did on elephants that was called Coming of Age with Elephants. And it was about a woman who had grown up in, in Kenya. Her father had um, worked for a conservation organization in, in Kenya. Woman, her name was Joyce Poole. And uh, she had written a book called Coming of Age with Elephants. And I, I did a film with her. And... First of all, to, to spend time around elephants is just a remarkable experience. They are uh, 
just amazing animals. They are emotional. They, when you see how they respond to their, their young. Um, but one of the most amazing moments was I'd always heard that elephants have this thing with bones. Um, so, and I wanted to capture that on, on film. So Joyce had said she was following one group of elephants and there was a, there were the bones of their um, matriarch that who had died, and she said that the um, and actually they had they had moved the bones away for safekeeping, but she said if we put the bones back here on the path that they will usually go to get water, you will see how they how they react, and so we we positioned ourselves and and set up the cameras and the elephants came on their sort of daily trek to find water, and they came to those bones and they stopped and they first just kind of fondled them and, and with their trunks and and they had passed other bones so this was you know they had passed other bones of other animals they stopped at these bones who were who were, was their matriarch and then they formed this circle facing out and just stayed there for like 30 minutes now they're they're thirsty they're on their way to water they they would never normally do that and they just stayed there like protecting these bones and then eventually went off but and they were trumpeting and you know it still gives me ch chill bumps to 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 remember that scene it was just remarkable and one of my other favorite moments was a, was a mother with a newborn calf and the newborns have these long trunks that they do not know what to do with <laughs> this one baby elephant stepped on his own trunk and could not figure out what to do and why he he couldn't move his head and he was struggling to move his head but he couldn't because he was stepping on his own trunk and we laughed um so and they did they i mean literally these animals would just make you laugh and cry mm -hmm. um so that was one i think another was um in the bismarck when we were filming the bismarck and we've been filming for a couple of days and really imaging the whole ship and suddenly we went, went we were filming over the front deck and we were dragging you know in, in the we didn't there were no people down there this was by, the way bob ballard works with the telepresence that he films with sleds and cameras and robots that go down so you can spend more time down there and we we're going over the front deck and and the the propellers on the rov the remotely operated vehicle made this the dust and the the silt um spray move Come away mm -hmm. and we suddenly realized that we were looking at this giant swastika on the front deck and you know we had been excited and you know we had found this ship and it was this amazing story and suddenly the room went silent and we suddenly remembered you know the significance of of what that ship represented mm -hmm. and and you know the people that had that had died be, because of what the nazis did and 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 but also the people that had died in the ship and it was this real you know there, there's just these things that you get caught up in the moment and then suddenly you're reminded of, of the significance and that was a very you know a very emotional a very emotional moment i would classify that as capturing magic and i think that's the beauty of what you do is when you capture a moment like that it's for eternity because you've captured it on film would you yeah. agree yeah no very much so and another film that i spent many years on was on on the maya and um, I was working with some some different archaeologists, Ricardo Agorcia and Bill Fash, down at, at a, um, a site called Copan in Honduras. Mm -hmm. And um, they found I was back here, and we did shoots over a couple of years. And I was back in in Washington, and I got a call. I was in the middle of a dinner party, and I got a call, and they said, "We have just found we've opened a tomb in this 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 pyramid called Rosalila." And they said, "We'll wait if you can get down here. We won't dig it out until you get down here." And so I rounded up a crew, you know, I served everybody dessert, <laughs> got on the phone, um, got a crew, got the flights, got the permits, got down there, I think within like 24 hours. And we went in and we, and the mag National Geographic magazine was filming too. So, and we were in this teeny little narrow passageway in the, into this tomb. And what they unwrapped then was these eccentric flints, which were these beautiful carved knives made out of flint that would take months to carve that had little teeny faces sometimes multiple faces and they slowly unwrap this it, it, it hadn't been touched in you know thousands of years no one had seen it or touched it and and we're in this team this line because i the cameraman the magazine photographer was first then the our cameraman the sound guy and then me way in the back and the archaeologist actually got tears in his eyes because this was 
such a, um, a monumental find. And um, what did it feel like for you that moment? Was there some kind of connection with the past? These people. It, it was. You suddenly mm. you do when you see something that 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 human hands spent so much time on and that nobody else has touched and nobody has seen and they they were sacred objects. Um, and you're in this dark cave underground with just a little light and this and this archaeologist who under even more than you do understands the significance of what being able to share this with scientists and the public and and show them what these these this remarkable civilization one of the things that they were able to create um you was do there, it it's, it's very moving was there fear surrounding some of it too because you don't you're going into the unexpected virtually into the dark there, there wasn't, I can't say, and it was ever fear. I mean, there's there's fear anytime you find a tomb of looting when you're not going to be there because the archaeologists aren't always there. So you're, you, you know, there's always this fear that when you find something special that then looters will get in and, and stuff. But but really, no, I think it's just a sense of wonder and awe and um and and just and 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 respect for the archaeologists that spend years and years and years and 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 trying to raise the money to go do another excavation and and um, to to find something like that and that applies to a lot of the shows you know that the, the Bismarck too it's you know you got to find people that'll underwrite those kind of expeditions and um, so people. You know the the scientists like Ballard and and like Ricardo and and Bill Fash and the and the people that do these studies and and Joyce Poole, um, studying elephants. You know they they, they work hard to sh to be able to share that information with us and and that's what I feel good about as a filmmaker to be able to then spread that to a bigger audience because sometimes that actually helps them get funding for 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 such important for, research. for more research. Yeah. How important is the team you put together? I'm thinking it's essential because. I'm thinking you you obviously need people that can follow orders, but you need people with instinct, basic instinct as well. Would that be true? It it, it is, and I always compare the job of a of a documentary producer to an orchestra conductor, and Good that analogy. without the orchestra, you're just standing up there with a stick in your hand. You know, you need everybody to work together and play their part. And there, and filmmaking is such a collaborative effort, and it starts from from the research you you know you usually have an associate producer that's helping you do the research and contacting everybody then you've got the cameraman who who you've got to trust and especially again in those days when we were working with film and not video you didn't see what that cameraman was getting you could look through the lens at the beginning to see if the shot looked right but then they were moving around and following stuff so you had to trust your cameraman you had to trust your sound man because if he missed the sound it wasn't any good. You know, you had assistant cameramen in those days who had to load film in a dark bag with their hands. And if they got a hair in the gate or they misloaded it, you could go home and realize you have nothing on that role. And then you come back and you've got editors, composers, writers, um, post production people. You have people processing the film. And then you got people that promote the film. And it, it, it requires everybody working together, working at their best, and your job as a producer is to enable them. And in fact, I often say one of the jobs of the producer is just to be grease. You are providing the grease so all the wheels turn smoothly <laughs> so that so that people who are really talented and skilled and have individual sets of skills can all do their best and then create this, hopefully, this symphony at the end. You had mentioned the, the analogy of music. I think that's a terrific one. Let's continue along that, those lines. How important is the score? To telling the story, to telling that narrative, it it, it is it is critical. Um, you know, you don't want you you want to avoid being manipul manipulative with your music, mm -hmm. and yet, good music is that additional element that can just can make or break a film. You know, if it, if you capture that right moment, and it doesn't. Um, you know, it doesn't get too repetitive so that a, a sequence that worked before can get boring if you've got a piece that just um, goes through. I mean, it, it is a bit of a luxury to get an original score these days. I mean, when, when I was doing the National Geographic specials, we always had an original score that was composed to picture. We would lock picture first, so you actually had these melodic pieces that told stories in and of themselves, and it really added another, a whole other dimension to the film. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a luxury these days. A lot of times you're using needle drop or you're composing it from existing music. I, I, I frankly don't even like to call it composing because it's you're you're um, 
manipulating or using existing music and, and putting it together in a way that, that helps tell your story. But it can make a big difference. It can add drama. It can add emotion. It can add sadness, joy, um, gravitas to a to scene to make it bigger. Um, so it, it is... It's it's a it's a luxury, but a wonderful one when you've got it. And when you're working together with a with a good composer, it is it is wonderful because it it really can enhance the film. What brought you? Is this part of the reason that brought you into working now with NGOs, non-government organizations, nonprofits? Yeah, and nonprofits. It's yeah, um, yeah, because I just think you know there there's so much work that needs to be done and and um, yeah, and I think in in the old days I think documentaries were actually making the world a better place by enlightening people. I mean, it was films about whales that led to legislation that protected whales. Films about wolves that led to pres, pres, means to protect them. Um, I'm not sure that very very much television is actually making the world a better place, but I think there is still um, video that that is doing that so like doing doing some video for save the children is is i really can feel good about and feel like it's um helping some of the work they're doing so yeah i think i i think i I like to see production as a force for good and and um i'm finding that with some of the new work we're gonna have to wrap up now but imagine yourself standing at a podium somewhere in canada hopefully not the northern part And you've got every single Canadian university student and international students as well, because, you know, it's on the Internet. And also there's a lot of international students in Canada. What would you say to them? Take advantage of whatever life throws at you. I never expected to be in television. It was a lucky break and a phone call that happened on one day. But embrace it. Go with it. Um, life, you know, when when they when it throws funny things at you, just enjoy it and look for the good in it, and um, take the road less traveled. Thank you so much for joining us, folks. Chris Weber has been our guest tonight. Uh, www.brenthollandshow.com. There you will find a whole wealth of of information and archives. The Jane Goodall. Uh, interview is there as well, folks. And just to let you know, Jane Goodall firmly believes in Bigfoot, and she gives great reasons for that in the show. And uh, there's your next documentary. Oh, no, they've got a show <laughs> out about that, don't they? <laughs> yeah, we, there, I think people show. have tried. <laughs> 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 Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Brent. My pleasure. Thank you. I'm Brent Holland from The Brent Holland Show. See you next time.